Testament. If you have your Bibles with you, we ask you to turn to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, and uh, we're going to begin reading in verse 10, Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 10. The Bible says, In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me, to do, the, to do thy will, O God. I'm sorry, I start reading in 6, drop down to verse 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10, the Bible says, By the which... We all are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Yeah. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering all times the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin, forever sat down on the right hand of God. Amen. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that, for after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, which the Lord which saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now, where remission of sin is, there is no offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiness by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and from bodies washed with pure water. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for another day to be in your house. Lord God, we thank you for your church that is met together in this place. We praise you for that. We pray that you would make us a close-knit church, that we would uh, bear each other's burdens and sorrows and happinesses. God, we pray this morning that you would meet with us. God, if you would uh, choose to save someone according to your marvelous grace, we would give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all, for it is in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now, we'll be preaching this morning on the boldness to draw near. Uh, on to draw near unto the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, even to draw near unto the, uh, unto the God Almighty, the Father, on the merit of Christ. Now, I think we live in a day and age today where people feel very distant from the person of Christ. And a lot of times, it's uh, really twofold. Number one is ignoring the Holy Ghost, which is our vehicle here in this day to approach unto Christ. And then the other side of that is our lives so laden with sin, we feel like we can't approach it. And, and, and so being distanced from Christ is, a, is never a good, uh, a good thing for the Lord God's people. And rather still, we ought to draw near unto him. Be bold about it. Come easily to the throne of grace. And that's what he calls us to do. Now, uh, I want you to see, first of all, that this letter is a, to the church at Jerusalem. Uh, uh, some people say it's to the nation of, Jeru uh, of the Hebrew nation. I don't think so, because all these letters were written to churches, not to nations. You know, you know why I don't think it's Jerusalem? I don't think it's the Hebrew people, because they had already rejected Christ. Yeah. 
Why, why would he possibly write something to them whenever he, they had already rejected him? So I think this letter was to the Jerusalem believers, those that had believed in Christ. Uh, the Bible says that Peter was the, was the pastor there at Jerusalem, and I don't think he wrote it because he was involved in some of the very same stuff. See, they were beginning to deny the efficacy or the efficiency or the workings of Christ. In other words, they were saying, uh, it's not enough. The going on the merit of Christ alone doesn't count. You need to be a good person. You need to do this. You need to do that. And leaving the merit of Christ behind and taking up against, the, again, the law of the previous age. And, and so that's why I don't think it's to national Israel at all, but rather to the church of Jerusalem, which was struggling. And if you read the whole matter of the letter, it was mostly saying what works were for what works were about and what works weren't about. And then I want you to see also that I believe probably that Paul was the writer of this letter. It's often given as the unknown epistle and, and I can see because it's never addressed by anyone where it says I, Paul, or anything like that, but it's very consistent with his theme. It, it, it looks like his other letters, but irregardless who wrote it, I want you to see that it's for our benefit and good because we still live in the church age as well. We still abide here in the very age that this was written, and we can get hung up on works as well. And so it's for us uh, just like it was for them. Now going back to uh, uh, verse 10, the Bible says, By the which will we are sanctified. Now, how are we sanctified? Uh, a lot of people uh, put that off as a Pentecostal term. Being sanctified it is a good term. It's, it's something the Bible speaks of time and time again. And there's really two parts to being sanctified. The first one, being set apart. And the second one, meaning holy. See, all through my years as a Baptist, everybody gets, uh, all will say, well, that's being set apart. Well, how do you get set apart? Well, the Bible says to be sanctified is to be holy. In other words, you can't live like this world and be a set apart for the use of Christ. You, you, have to, you have to embrace that book. And, and, and so we find here is, as uh, the writer is writing, he, he, he says the first thing you need to do, by the which will we are sanctified, how? Not from being a good person, not from doing what you want to do, not from uh, keeping the law, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Right. Now, that's a one-time atonement. That's a one-time salvation. You know, I, I have a Catholic friend at work, and we talk a whole lot, probably the most approachable Catholic that I've ever dealt with. And, and, and they go before their priest, and he, he puts that dove in their mouth and, and gives that little bit of wine to them, and they literally think it's the blood and body of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what that does? According to this very writing here, it puts him to an open shame. It means that, he's, that the first time wasn't enough, that the first blood shedding of the blood wasn't good enough, that it has to be done again and again and again. Now, I've seen a lot of things in my life, but I never saw anybody die twice, have you? And if that's possible, that's what we're doing, is it not? That Christ is dying again and again and again and again. And, and, and so we find then that Paul is trying to make it clear, listen, that sacrifice was a one-time, once-and-for-all event. Verse 11, that every priest standeth daily and, min uh, and every priest standeth daily ministering and offering all times the same sacrifices. In other words, in the old Judeo uh, system, 
system, they would maybe think an evil thought, or they would uh, debride their their neighbor, and they'd say, oh man, that's two turtle, turtle doves and, and, and a goat. And they'd go down, and they would offer that sacrifice, and the next day he geisted another neighbor, and he'd slap around on his wife, and he'd have to figure that up, and go down and do the very same thing again. Sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice, that was the law. It was not grace. It was not grace. And, and, and so we find then, apparently the church at Jerusalem was trying to bring those items back into the service of God. And he says, no, no. Verse 12. But this man, meaning Christ, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever. See, it's a finished work. You know why we're secure in the belief of Jesus Christ? He did it one time and one time alone. See, there, there, there's no merit in us. You know, you can say what you want to and they get all pitiful and stuff. And, oh, I, I've sinned again. I'm lost again. You know what they're really saying? Hey, it's all about me. I, I, I'm good enough to do this on my own. I just have to try better next time. Listen, if that's what you're depending on, you don't have nothing. Because you've never, you, you never, you know people who believe a works-based salvation or even a works-maintained salvation, they've never seen that they're really hopeless and helpless before Christ. That, that's the real thing. They think that there's still some little bit of good in them, some little bit of ability, and they're going to go with that instead of going with the merit of the Holy One of Israel. That was their situation. And we see even very on in the days of the first church there at Jerusalem, it was done leaking in, and he says, listen, you can't do it. Then I want you to see, the Bible says, after he had done this great sacrificial work unto Christ, that he came and he sat down by the Father forevermore. See, uh, at work, I don't sit down until my job is done. And here lately, I've been having to uh, work a lot of time on the floor and push that med cart around. And, and you know what? I don't sit down until the job's done. <laughs> Because being 51 years old, it's a whole lot, uh, a whole lot, a whole lot harder to get up and get going. Yeah, right. So you might as well get it done while you while you're going. And so that indicates my job is finished. The meds are out. I'm done. My residents are taken care of. And when he got done, he says, "Listen, this issue with sin is done. It's taken care of. I'm done with it." And he sat down by the side of his father. And it says, making his enemies his footstools. See, you know who Christ's biggest enemy is? It's Satan. Yeah. And he's under, he's under Christ's authority. His other enemies are the little imps and devils that were cast into the earth in the rebellion, as it's recorded in Isaiah chapter 12. And they're under his footstool too. When you, when you see the deception of the day that we live in, just remember that's the working of these little imps. And they're under his feet. Don't panic. Uh, don't, don't get tore up about it because, listen, our God is got this. He's above all. He's with all. And it's under his feet. Verse 13. From henceforth, expecting to his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Now, I want you to see that he, uh, it only takes one offering. In other words, apparently I believe that this church, because see there was daily sacrifices, there were sacrifices of season, and then there were sac annual sacrifices that just went one time a year. And apparently they were letting this mingle back in. I have a lot of friends, uh, if you want to call them that, uh, that are mess Messianic Jew. And uh, uh, they, they Messianic meaning they embrace the Messiah, they embrace Christ, but they live like Jews. 
You know what? I don't believe it. I believe just like the sacrifice, the Judea culture was put behind us. Uh, I don't believe in Ram Kapoor. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't believe in any of them because that is behind us and we live in the Christian age. And I don't know one sac I, I don't know one holiday that's really sanctioned by God. Uh, in, in the modern day Christian. Uh, I, I really don't. And, and, and so we find then that he says, listen, everything is going to be under my feet. Everything is beneath me. He believed that. For everyone offering he hath perfected, notice this, by one offering he has perfected for them that are sanctified. Now, this again shows that the atonement, the sanctifying, the, the setting apart, they're only for a certain group. They're not for everybody, despite what the world's saying. And despite the world saying, you can participate if you wish. I want you to get this verse again. For by one offering, he hath perfected or made complete or purified for everyone that are sanctified. So if you're not sanctified in eternity past, it's just not for you. It, it, it will never mean anything to you. It will never break your heart. It will never lift your spirits. It will never help you in any way. Why? Because it was never, you were never sanctified. <laughs> See, um, uh, I, I am not Pentecostal, and I don't believe in progressive sanctification, but I believe there are different kinds of sanctification. From the world, before the world began, all the believers were sanctified as an elect people unto Christ, and they belonged to him. That was sanctified. They were set apart for that purpose. I believe still, and if you believe in, uh, in sovereignty of God, somewhere along the way, uh, out of the wisdom of God and his perfect plan, I believe preachers were set aside. Uh, I, I, and that is a type of sanctification before I even breathed the breath of life before I even knew what was that is a type of sanctification this one is mine and this is what you'll do now if you don't believe that remember when Paul was saved he said, he said and I will show him what great things he must suffer for my name's sake see he already knew every, every time he'd be whipped Every time he'd be left for dead, every time he was shipwrecked, and it was to his own glory and his own honor. He, he knew it from the beginning. And, and so we see that type of sanctification. Not only does he know we're going to be saved, he knows what we will endure in the present life that we live. That's who he is. And so um, uh, the writer reminds the church of Jerusalem, hey, this is not about you. It's about Christ. It's about lifting him up. It's about giving him honor and glory. Hey, get the wind out of yourselves. This is not about you. And, and so we find he says that. He gives them that as well. Verse, verse 15. Whereof, meaning because the understanding of, because these things are known, whereof the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost, Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. Now, uh, meaning the writer, meaning the preacher, or meaning whoever was teaching these things, he says the Holy Ghost is a witness of us. In other words, saying, hey, that's right. Listen, when you're on this side of the pews and uh, in the pulpit area, listen, sometimes things get a little discouraging. Some things get a little bit of a challenge. And when you hear an amen, it's an encouragement. You see what I'm saying? Right. Uh, it means you're going in the right direction. And, and, and very similarly here, we, we find the writer saying the Holy Ghost does that for truth. See, sometimes you get in some of them sovereign grace churches and they're more like primitive Baptists and they look like they've been eating a, a big load of sour persimmons. And they look back at you like they could kill you. And you know what? That's when the Holy Ghost <laughs> gives you what you need. Right. And so, if you don't know the Holy Ghost, I dare say you don't know Christ. Right. If you don't, if you're not experienced the Holy Spirit, 
you've not experienced Christ either because see, the Holy Ghost is the one that says that's him. That's him. This is the answer to sin. It's Christ. It's the complete sacrifice made on Calvary 2,000 years ago. Who conveys that to the living man on the inside is Christ. Listen, we can all read and write, and we can read it on a book, but it means nothing without the Holy Ghost. It means nothing. And so we find then that the Lord's people, the church of Jerusalem, needed a reminder about the Holy Ghost. You know, in the modern day, the Lord's church, true churches need that reminder as well, don't they? It's not about logic. It's not about thinking you are saved. It's about this person of the Holy Ghost doing a complete work in your life. Verse 16, this is the covenant I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. Now, a covenant is agreement. Covenant is something that God enters into his people and, and about, you know, it, it, this is the thing of Christianity. If something comes along and sweeps people away, you about can write her down, she's wrong. Now, about 10 years old, uh, I mean, 10 years ago, y'all remember all that big covenant theology that swept through God's people. Well, this is the type of verse where it comes from. And they take the verse out of context and they say, hey, we live in an, under a new covenant. Uh, we don't live under a new covenant. Uh, the, the covenant is under Christ. You know, uh, besides him saying you go on to the world to, and preach the gospel to all nations, I don't know any covenant that he entered the church with, do you? I, I, don't, see, I, don't, see, I don't see that in the Bible. And, and, and so uh, we find here that he says, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws, this is the covenant, this is the agreement, this is the promise, I will put my laws into their, meaning the redeemed, the saved, their hearts, in their minds, will I write them. So listen, if you have the covenant of truth, if you understand well, and we all do, thou shalt not kill, and it's written in your heart, and you know it from the inside out, listen, the next time somebody tells you that abortion is a choice, you'll be ready to say, oh no, it's the killing of another human life. It, it is the killing of an individual. You know why? Because it's written in your heart. Yeah. You don't have to sit there and think about it. Right. Next time you see, and I, 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 was, I was scrolling through Facebook the other day, and there's this new book out, and, and I guess uh, they, they talk about how good it's selling, selling, but I want to say if it's selling so good, why are you selling it on Facebook, right? But it's about two young boys that think they're, uh, that they're in love with each other. Yeah. You, you know what that is? The Bible says it's an abomination. Amen. Now, you won't hear it that way today, but the Bible says men with men and women with women is an abomination before God. It is not an alternate lifestyle. It's not a choice that people make. It is an, it is an abomination unto the person of God. And he said, I will write that in their heart. So these sodomite women that pastor Lutheran churches that say, oh, God understands us. I want to say, well, he understands more than you think he does because he understands that you're a rebel in every way and you've never touched the goodness of God's grace. He understands that. Amen. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. When someone really gets saved, you don't just have to hound them and hound them down. You, you won't have to hound them to come to the Lord's house. You won't have to hound them to dress right. You won't have to hound them to get some of that junk out of your home. It'll be just as natural as me walking back to that pulpit. And if it's not there, I'd make my calling and election sure. Wouldn't you? And, and so we find then as Lord's people uh, what, we, what we need to remember and what we need to recognize uh, is that law in the heart is a result of salvation and if it's not there there's a big, a big problem somewhere. Verse 17 and their sins 
and iniquities will I remember no more. Yeah. Now you talk about some good, good, rich stuff. He goes, those people that are under that covenant of grace, I don't even know they see it. I don't even understand the fact that they're capable. You talk about a good verse for security of the believer. The next one, time somebody comes across with it, you take them that and say, hey, the Bible says my God don't even remember it anymore. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That, that, that's the situation we live in. And I personally believe the Jerusalem church had, had forgotten some of the riches of Christ and they were bringing the law back in just like the Messianic Jews of today. They're bringing and piling that stuff in. And he says, I don't even remember the fact that you sinned. I don't even understand it. And, and so we find then that the covenant that we operate under, if you want to call it that, is simply grace, the goodness of God, the highly, the highly unmerited, undeserved, but the good favor of God. That's it. His grace, his goodness, his mercy, that's what we operate under in the modern day. And that should be uh, where we cherish. Verse 18. Now, where remission, now where remission of these, meaning the sin, now where the remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. So if you're really saved, there's nothing left to be said for you. Now, uh, you know what, this morning, there's no, those of you that are lost, listen to me real good, the only sacrifice happened 2,000 years ago. There's nothing you can do that's good enough. Right. There's nothing that you can do that make you acceptable unto Christ. Just claim the blood of Jesus. That sacrifice happened 2,000 years ago. Claim it and say, yeah, yeah it's mine. It's mine. I, I, I belong unto Christ. And, and, and so we find uh, very clearly then that he says we uh, the remission is there, now where remission of these is there's no more offering said nothing more to be done. Verse 19 having therefore brethren having therefore, meaning salvation, having been born again, having been on the merit of Christ, having come on the, the service of the atonement alone, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter the holiness by the blood of Jesus. <laughs> now, you know, you know what I see today? I don't see many bold Baptists, do you? They run around like a bunch of whipped puppies. Uh, and you know, and while they sacrifice on last time, I mean, while they they focus on last time things, it's because they're there's a there's a beat down. That's the only thing they think they got forward to look, you know, look forward to. But I want you to see here, the Bible says quite the opposite to the church of Jerusalem. He says, you come bold unto the... In other words, you come before him and say, Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, high and lifted up are you. High above my understanding is your ways. Glory to his sweet name forever and ever. Amen. Come boldly. You know what? You don't find people doing that, do you? I mean, really. And if you saw some of that going on, Derek, you start some of that fellowship next weekend, we'll see what happens. You see what I'm saying? It's so foreign to our people, they don't know that it's a treasure. Right? And we're doing boldly. Now, uh, another thing among the Lord's people that I don't quite get, we can come boldly with our needs, can't we? Oh, Lord, give me $50. Man, we, we run to the throne of that, can't we? So why don't we go boldly with his praise? Why don't you go boldly beseeching salvation for your children and your grandchildren? Mm -hmm. Why don't you come boldly and say, uh, it's all about you anyway. It's 
to come boldly before the throne and, and, and ask him and give him praise and give him great glory. Oh, that I would like him to David and that the majority of my prayers would simply be praise. Blessed be the name of the Most High. That's what prayer needs to be about. And so we find, uh, he says, do it boldly. Having, therefore, brethren, boldness to enter the holiness, meaning the holy of holies, on the blood of Christ, the, on the blood of Jesus. Now, I want you to see that in, in, in the Mosaic time, the only people who could do that was the high priest. One time per year, that's it. And now we all have the ability to run boldly unto him, uh, to lay out our, our, no, uh, our needs and our prayers before him and give him great glory and honor. By no, notice this, by new and living way. In other words, not the dead sacrifices, but a living way. By a brand new covenant, by uh, or a brand new testament, by a new and living way. By a new and living way, which he have consecrated or, or sacrificed or poured the blood out on, consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. So I want you to see that the veil... If you remember on the day of the Lord Jesus' sacrifice, the Bible says that the, the veil at the back of the temple ripped from top to bottom. Mm -hmm. Remember that? Now the veil is Christ. We, we go to him and he takes it to the Father. He is the veil. Remember, remember when John got the revelation? And I think that, uh, <laughs> no, maybe it was Paul. And he says, we look through a glass darkly right now. Right. That's kind of where, where, what, what we're looking to do. Uh, looking through a, a veil. And Christ back there doing all our mediation. Mm -hmm. And you, you remember when, when John wrote the, <laughs> wrote the Revelation. And he, uh, there was a man walking in and among the seven candlesticks. And he said it was like unto the, person, like unto the uh, Son of God. Yeah. So Jesus was doing those seven churches bidding. And you know what? Most of those churches didn't deserve nothing. Two of them. <laughs> About the best you could did get was Philadelphia, right? Mm -hmm. But apparently he was doing as much bidding on the case of Laodicea than he was Philadelphia. You see what I'm saying? Isn't that a good, wonderful, marvelous God that it really don't matter what we're doing, but he's there in among the candlesticks presenting what we need, presenting our praise on behalf of, on, right unto God. See, that's why he's positioned at the right hand of the Father is because he has our bidding to do. So then, knowing that, the only activation, the only active person of God here has to be the Holy Ghost and him alone. The rest of that verse says, uh, that is to say, his flesh. Verse 21, and having a high priest over the house of God, meaning Christ. Now, I want you to see it was a high priest over the house of God, not just Jerusalem, not just the Jews, the entire house of God, all creation, all people. That is our advocate. That is our person. Having that, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Now, I would be a man most miserable this morning if I had no assurance about eternity, wouldn't you? Yeah. If you thought maybe so, maybe not. Man, what a misery to live in. But here we, we find that on the merit of Christ, we can have full assurance. No, without a shadow of doubt that you're on your way to glory. Now let me say this, if you got little doubts trickling in up here, first of all, make the call and we'll let you sure. And don't ever be afraid to take, to take huh, witness against yourself of Christ. Because you know what, if he's saying you're not, you're probably not. Just because you said some other foolish prayer don't mean that you stand in Christ, right? I want some assurance more than, well, I remember what I said. Well, so what? Penny Penny said the sky was falling, but it didn't make it so, did it? 
I, 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 want, I want something that's more real than that. And, and so we uh, we find then that we as the Lord's people, we, uh, we need to set in the assurance that Paul was reminding the Jerusalem church about, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now, I personally don't mean that body wash. I don't believe it means the dunking, the baptism. I believe it's that word doing its job in our lives, washing us closer and closer to Christ. You know what? When when you see that men are not are not to, supposed to have long hair, you won't have any trouble getting this mess cut off. When you see that one, women are to listen. You won't have an issue with cutting it off. And you know what? This is the thing. Despite women's nature, you really won't care how you look. Because why? You're in the will of God. You see what I'm saying? Uh, that's some standards we need to speak to, ain't it? I'd be worried if I didn't have them, wouldn't you? It's what the Word of God says. And, and, and so we find then... As the Lord's people, we ought to we ought to embrace these and under, and let us understand and know that uh, the Word will do this for us. It will draw closer and clo it draw us closer and closer to Him. Verse twenty three. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for He is for He is faithful that promised. Do you hold fast to your profession? Everyone in this building knows when and the, and the, the circumstances uh, uh, surrounding the day the Lord saved me. And you know what? I'm still holding to it with everything I got. And it's not that you have to hold out faithful. That's foolishness. But you know what? I want to be double sure, don't you? When, when death comes looking for me, I don't need any, any qualms about it. Now, the good thing about 30 years of nursing is this. I really don't fear death physically. Now, Donna better be sure I'm getting the right stuff. You know what I'm saying? But I can fear what's after. You see what I'm saying? And if you're lost, that's what you need to do. You need to be very fearful. You, you, you need to look unto Christ. You, you, you need to be wary of the last day. Because, listen, dear friend, it's coming. If it's coming on the wings of a cloud, or if it's coming when death comes and snatches you up, I don't know which will come first, but either way, I can assure you that it is coming. Then look unto Christ. Uh, verse 24. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Now, first of all, consider one another. In other words, as Brother Junior was saying, he says, I pray for the church every day, and, and I kind of do the same thing. I try to imagine you sitting in your spot and going before the Lord God and, and trying to intervene on your behalf, and, and uh, that's what we ought to do. But to do that, you have to consider one another. You know, if you don't consider people, you're going to offend them. Mm -hmm. That's why Paul said, if it offendeth my brother to eat meat, I will eat no meat. Right. Because he considered their situation. You know, when we go in and among the Amish, uh, we don't insult their beliefs. Donna don't go down there and say, you've got an ugly black dress on. That's their culture, right? Why, why would you do that? Consider them. Now, in the very same way, I need to consider you spiritually. If I see you drawn from the faith, I need to consider that. If I see you doing things that don't speak unto Christ, I need to consider that. If you're not draw, wearing modest clothes, I need to consider that. And you know what? The worst thing a pastor can do is to ignore that stuff. And so we need to consider one another. We need, we need to look, look at one another. Let us consider one another, what? To provoke unto love and good works. Now, as I say, if you approach somebody and say, you know what? Uh, what, what my issue with you is, is you're running around in tight clothes all the time. You know what you've just done? You just made an enemy. Do it with love. And you know what? If you can't do it with love, don't do it. That's right. Yeah. Just keep your big mouth shut. 
But if you can do it with love and provoke them to good works. Uh, take that, take your memories or take your Bible and say, this is what the Lord showed me down through the years. I understand where you're at. I've been there. But let me, let me show you what the Bible teaches. And I guarantee you, if you do that approach, you'll have a lot better results. And, and, and provoking or stimulating or, or uh, implanting a desire toward good works. That, that, ought to be, that ought to be what we want. Now, last verse. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Now, all this up to now, I notice this is under provoking one another to good works. And then he says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Uh, when you're not here, it's a discouragement to me. And when I'm not here, it's a discouragement to you, I'm sure. Uh, when did, now, I, I personally believe there's no set days that the church has to meet. I like to be together on the Lord's Day. But you know what the Bible says? It never says every Sunday we want you guys to meet together. The Bible just doesn't teach that. Uh, you know, the old primitive Baptists, uh, they meet one time a month. That may be why the Lord ain't living too much, right? But that's what they've agreed to do. And if they show up once a month, you know what? They've done what the, they've done what the church agreed to, right? But we've agreed to meet on Sunday, and we've agreed to meet on Wednesday nights, and you know what? I need to be here. And not just because I'm a pastor. If I wasn't a pastor, I'd show up and I would say, uh, Amen, and praise the Lord, and, and do what I can to encourage the church, because that's what we are to do, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. So apparently the church at Jerusalem was laying out. They weren't meeting like they should. But exhorting, but uh, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now I personally see the day approaching, so I'm my, uh, I want to exhort you to hang in there. I want you to I want to exhort you to keep on keeping on. I want to exhort you that there is a mighty God in heaven and all this craziness is under His feet this morning. I want to exhort you. Uh, to make your calling and election sure. I want you to exhort. I want to exhort you if you're uh, saved and not one of the members of true churches. I want to exhort you to embrace the church. See, when you exhort somebody, you don't kick them while they're down, do you? Right. Encourage. Encourage them. And man, you know what? I've seen too much of that as a Baptist. Well, I knew he wouldn't make it. I make a motion to discipline, right? I, I, I mean, I have literally saw that. And I don't believe that's what the Bible teaches to you. Uh, I believe we're to go to them in love and say, brother, I've been missing you at church. Is there anything I can help you with? What? Tell me what's going on. Tell me how the devil's on you. You know, when, when we usually go, we don't get down, and I'm the world's worst for it, so I'm not pointing fingers. Uh, of getting to the crook of the matter. Uh. But a lot of times the reason we get to the crook of the matter is this. Why ain't you coming to church? Yeah. Hey, we already know that, don't we? Why don't you go to them and say, listen, what is discouraging? What, what has brought you so low? And is there any way I could help you with it? That really gets to the problem, doesn't it? Without being accusatory. So uh, this morning, I want to encourage you that we need to just hold fast to the faith. We need to keep looking unto Christ and do exactly what the Bible calls us to do. Yeah. Um, it's right here in your heart. If you're saved, it's right here. I won't have to tell you what to do every time because you'll, you'll make a reference right here and say, oh, I know what to do. And you know what? If you don't, Maybe you don't have what you think you do.